Welcome again to another series of oral history interviews. My name is Tom Peters. I'm the Dean of Library Services at Missouri State University. Today's date is Monday, October 8th. October 8th? We agree so far, Tom. All right. <laughs> of the year 2018. Do we agree on that, too? <laughs> Anno Domini 2018. Uh, our special guest today is David Harrison, who is a uh, an author, a poet, a uh, raconteur. No, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll look that up and see if we still agree. <laughs> <laughs> and what we envision, this is the first of what we envision to be a series of interviews. So, David, you've published, I should have looked this up, didn't do my research, uh, 90 books so far? The uh, the most recent publication was ninety five. Ninety five. And I have five more in the oven. They're in contract, oh, wow. and so they're with various publishers. So you'll be hitting a hundred here. That, you know, they uh, uh, have I've sold my one hundredth book. Wow. So now I'm getting ready to set set out to do another hundred. I mean, that's an amazing that's an amazing feat right there. And, and how many years have you been doing this? My first book came out in nineteen sixty nine. So okay, that's right at fifty. 50 years, I guess. Coming up on 50 years, so well, your good. average is two a year. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's about what it is, is average. Yeah. Two a year. And some years, uh, nothing. This year, it was two. And uh, next year, one. The following year that I know of at this point is one, but I think there will be others. And, uh, and so it goes. Yeah. Well, I want to talk to you about, you know, your creative process and the process of bringing a book to the point of publication, um, whatever that means in the 21st century, because you got e-books now and streaming media. Oh, and who's yes, going, we do. Who, who knows all what. Um, and then, you know, we'll kind of come at it probably higgledy-piggledy. Uh, so um, one thing, you know, let me just start in and say, at this stage of your career, do you have multiple books that you're working on at a given time? Do you mm -hmm. have, yeah, okay. I do. It's the way it works. If you work more or less, well, I don't work full time. I do stop for for my wife and things like that. <laughs> but uh, until recently, I, I worked five days a week from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So I put in wow, whatever that is, 12 hours a day, five days a week. Um, my wife has recently uh, sold our uh, gift store gambles. Uh -huh. And so I committed to uh, changing my work schedule to, to uh, stop uh, working at 1 o'clock p.m. So I now, I work from 6 a.m. To, to 1 p.m., but that's still uh, almost 40 hours a week, and that's, that's as much as a lot of people work. So I can't say that I'm retired. Yeah. And when you put in that many hours a week, things are going to happen, and... When I finish, well, I'll give you an example. About an hour ago, from the time I'm doing this, I had an email from a friend of mine named uh, Laura Robb, and she's a well-known uh, literacy expert who travels the country, gives a lot of talks, writes a lot of books, and she's a friend of mine. And so the two of us have talked for years about one of these days, we need to do something together. Uh, she and I sat across the table at a conference a few weeks ago, and Laura got on a roll about something she thought we could we could do. And uh, my hearing isn't as good as it used to be, so I did a lot of nodding just because it was Laura, and not knowing exactly what I was agreeing to do. <laughs> you nodded your way into a, a ten-book deal. <laughs> well, Laura kept getting more excited, so of course I did too. <laughs> Um, a week or so later, she sent me an outline of what I had agreed to do and got so excited about. And then I really did get, get excited. And so today, she sent me a fleshed out outline that she proposes to send to uh, the editor, who happened to be sitting right next to Laura during that, that luncheon that day. Well, I did, did a little tweaking, and uh, just a little while ago, sent Laura my uh, my okay. Mm -hmm. So that will probably go to the editor within the next week or so. Right now she's working somewhere else on Long Island. Mm -hmm. Well, so I, that means I'm working on a book, doesn't it? Except that <laughs> we're at the very, very first step. 
and goodness knows how long it will take before the editor responds. And then she may say, what? No, no, I don't want to do that. That's, that's not going to work for my life. In which case, we may start with another publisher and another publisher and so on. Yeah. Or she may say, yay, let's do it. But if she says, yay, I still have to write 62 poems for this, 64 poems for this book. Uh -huh. And Laura still has to do all the, the work that she will do to provide insight for classroom teachers and how to use the poems and so on. Yeah. So you're looking at easily a year of creative work and then throw in all of everything else that goes with it. <clears throat> so yeah. We're probably looking at three years. Yeah. So obviously if I'm spending say 35 hours a day, five days a week, I'm, I'm going to be doing a lot of other things between now and three years from now. Yeah. And so you you layer these things, and and I just finished yesterday re rewriting a middle grade novel that I've been working on for about three years. Mm. Just sent that to my uh, to my agent, and she will get that out tomorrow, and so on. So yeah, I'll probably have. So something. So you've never worked with uh, Ms. Rob before. This is a first first collaboration. First time with her. I visited her class. She also was a seventh grade teacher. So mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. So I, I was was over there at her request one time years ago. That's where we met actually. Yeah. So this will be a first. Yeah. yeah. But you write novels too. Yes. Well, I'm trying to teach myself how. Um, my first book in 1969 was a picture book, The Boy with the Drum. Uh -huh. And a few years later, I began to write some nonfiction, too, just to keep mm -hmm. you know, expanding. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until about 20 years later that I wrote my first poetry, I mean, for publication. Mm -hmm. So that gave me a new uh, jolt of energy and excitement about what to write and yeah. how to think and how to approach it. Uh, a few years after that, I began to write books now and then for classroom teachers. And I always uh, buddy with somebody, a Laura Robb or a Tim Rosinski or a mm -hmm. um, Mary Jo Fresh or someone. Because I don't have the, the educational credentials, I have the writer's credentials. Mm -hmm. So it takes two of us um, to work together to bring, bring something worthwhile to the teacher. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a while since I've added anything else, and so about three years ago, I decided I would like to I'd like to write a chapter book mm -hmm. because sometimes kids in classrooms ask me, um, "Do you write stories about horses?" No. Do you write joke books? No. Well, how about mystery books? Do you write mystery books? No, I don't write mystery books. <laughs> How about chapter book? No, I don't. Well, look at my books and you see what I write. Anyway, it goes like that. <laughs> I finally decided, okay, okay, I'll write a chapter book. Uh, so I made up a story based on uh, an idea that, that came to me when I was, uh, my wife and I went up the Amazon River years ago with the friends of the uh, zoo, uh, safari kind of thing. And I wrote this uh, chapter book story and I sent it to an editor I had met. And she said, well, I love the story, but it isn't a chapter book at all. It's too long for that. You've written a middle grade novel. I said, oh yeah, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did with you all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. So I still haven't written a chapter book, <laughs> nor have I sold a middle grade novel. <clears throat> Pardon me, but I have uh, two of them out ready now. And, yeah. We'll see. We'll so see. the hundred hundred works that you've written, so the novel that you just finished, I would call that a specula speculative novel yeah, because right. That's right. because you don't have a publisher lined up. You nope, nope. you got an agent who's shopping it around. That's exactly right. As opposed to a book where you pretty much go into the project with a publisher lined well, up. Well, yes. Yeah, so if you'd like to to use pirates as an example, that's a yeah. good one. Yeah. Um, How did pirates come to be? Well, yeah, I'll hold it up here. We're talking about pirates. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> pirates, pirates. All right. <laughs> okay, I got one too. <laughs> uh, this began in 2005. I didn't know that until I knew Tom Peters was going to be here, and I looked it up. <laughs> uh, Thirteen years ago. Yeah. 
So in December of that year, I got this note. Uh, it was from my, it was from Stephen Roxburgh, who at that time was the publisher, editor in chief for Boyd's Mills Press line of books, and um, he was also my poetry editor. Stephen had, uh, previous to that appointment, owned his own small publishing company, but he had sold it to Boys Mills Press, mm -hmm. and in exchange, he became the publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got a note from Stephen, and if you don't mind, I, I'll read this. It's short, sure. and I'd like to read it in the record and have make sure I got so it So this right. just came out over the transom, as they say. This just, was uh, the just, email from Stephen to me. Just dropped in, huh? Um, David, I work with an artist named Dan Burr, whom I've known for 20 plus years. He's done a million jackets for me, but only recently did we come up with a book for him. He goes on to talk about the first book that, that um, this fellow did. Um, what does all this have to do with you? Well, it turns out that Dan has always wanted to paint pirates. Here's a simple, you know, here's a sample painting. And, I looked at this one painting by this guy, and I just fell in love with it. I, he didn't—he had me at that, but I uh, still had to finish reading. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about pirates? Would it appeal to you to research and write a dozen or so poems about pirates? For example, the usual famous historical figures, and it goes on. Yeah. The point is not to glorify pirates, but it's hard to keep a little and not so little boys from loving the concept. Um, and he goes on, the point, the point of pirates would be to capture the romance and appeal of the concept rather than the harsh reality of the matter. So it goes on from there, but yes, I, I looked at the painting. Um, this would never happen again, I actually opened the right page. <laughs> um, this, if you can see it. Yeah, I'll zoom in there, there we go. All right. That was the painting that uh, Dan Burr sent. Wow. And uh, he lives in the, uh, the West and uh, is just in Idaho, Tetonia. I couldn't think of the Tetonia. community. Yeah. Tetonia, Idaho. And Dan is just a remarkable artist, um, as well as a genuinely uh, nice guy. He, he teaches art, but he's an outdoorsman. Mm -hmm. uh, he he uh, takes uh, people out to guide them on fishing trips, and, and uh, he paints very often the, the trout and the fish and the outdoors that he, he sees. And he has made most of his living over the years uh, doing some ranching mm -hmm. and um, painting these wonderful uh, pictures. Are these watercolors? What he does is, uh, Dan works with live models to sketch, uh -huh. and once he has down what he wants, then he goes to the computer, and he uses the computer uh, to enhance his art and finish it. Uh -huh. I don't understand any of that, but I, I understand what I like, and I, I really do like his work. Uh -huh. So Dan and I began this correspondence precipitated by an introduction by Stephen Roxburgh, who sent us uh, both uh, an email, and he said, David, uh, this is uh, Dan Burr, he's a gentleman, and he's a fine artist. Dan, this is David, he's a gentleman too, and he's a good writer. Why don't you boys get together and make us a book? That's never happened before, it'll never happen again. It was just, everything was lined up somewhere. Yeah. And so we literally were invited to do a book together. Um, Stephen trusted both of us. He knew we were both good at what we did, what we do. And um, so Dan and I began a correspondence of, well, hey Dan, what do you think about this? And, hey David, I, yeah, I love that, what about this? And over a period of, I don't know, weeks or months maybe, uh, we, we, we had a list of situations that we both agreed mm -hmm. would work from, from our respective points of view. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how we got started. Once I got into reading, you know, researching the subject, and by the way, there are some wonderful resources out there on 
on pirates of that period. Uh, very scholarly work, and, yeah. and a lot of a lot of research has gone into the subject. So I was I was able to to learn a lot about pirates in a relatively uh, brief period. So I went back to Stephen and complained, and I said, "You told me um, to kind of leave the harsh part out, but I can't." I said, "These were bad people." <laughs> These were thugs and killers, and some of them, you know, they're rapists, and they, they did terrible things to men and women and children. And I said, they're killers. What am I supposed to do? He said, not my problem. He said, you're the writer. You take care of it. So, <laughs> uh, being sensitive better to that he was. Uh, so that's what I did. And the, uh, the poems have no first-person bloodshed in them. No. Uh, it sort of skirts the issue, talks about the issues without really presenting anything that's too gory. Yeah. Um, Hanging is mentioned a couple of times. Yeah, so uh, it turned out okay. And uh, yeah. it won a lot of blue ribbons, so we can talk about that, or I can read poems, or whatever, whatever you want. We're like. bound to dance the hempen jig unless we get away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so you worked on most of the book without ever meeting face to face with Dan. I didn't meet Dan until the book was published. Really? And um, he and I appeared at a conference together and um, co-presented. And then on another occasion, uh, as a matter of fact, this is signed by to me from Dan oh. uh, when we were in Warrensburg together. For David Harrison, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be working with you, and I felt the same way about. Uh, Dan. So um, then we met in Texas at another uh, conference, and since then, you know, that's it. Just no, no, a third time. Um, when this book was chosen, I, and I may be getting ahead of my story, but when this book was chosen in 2013 um, by the Missouri Center for the Book to represent the state of Missouri at the National Book Fair in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very great honor for me. I was thrilled to death, of course, for Dan as well. So in Warrensburg, at the university there, uh, Naomi Williams uh, had a, well, the, the center did, but she, mm -hmm. she was on the, on the spot, uh, uh, a reception uh, for us, and Dan came to that. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I've been with Dan Burr three times. <laughs> and it was a wonderful opportunity to see him again and to, uh, to grin for the camera a little bit. Yeah. Um, have all your books been children's books? And I'm, that might be a troubling... I'm sorry, what? Have they all been children's books? Uh, well, yes. Uh, it, 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 in the sense that the education books that I write are obviously also... Yeah. Uh, they're, they're written for adults, for teachers, but... <clears throat> To apply to their classroom situation, so I haven't pursued um, any uh, writing, you know, fiction or otherwise, for an adult reader outside of, of education. Although for the first uh, six years that I wrote, that's all I did. I, I began trying to become a, a short story writer, oh. and uh, so I learned a lot of my trade writing, uh, writing for an adult reader. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my background, my educational background is in science, so I really didn't have kids in mind. Uh, I was hmm. going to uh, go off and save the world somewhere as a parasitologist. Uh, I studied uh, tapeworm, this was my master's research at Emory University, was uh, a tapeworm called Hymenolopus diminuta, and um, found only in rats. Hmm. And unfortunately, rats weren't hiring when I graduated, so I, I couldn't find a job as a, as a parasitologist. But I, I took that in part because I've, I sort of fancied the idea of going to South America or Africa or someplace for a period of time and working in some way in the health uh, yeah. industry because that's in some of those areas they, they do put up with a lot of, of terrible things. and. and of course, tapeworms of one kind or another are part of them. That didn't work out, but uh, I still had the education and I still have that in my head. Mm -hmm. So when I turned to writing, 
uh, I'm very often informed by what I know and think mm -hmm. I know and what I love about nature and, and uh, animals uh, inside and outside of us. And, yeah, and you research your books. So like in the Pirates book, you've got a bibliography about oh, 10 books here, it looks like. Right yes, uh, yeah. that isn't unusual for me. Uh, there again, uh, Tom, I think it's because uh, research is, is one of the main things you, you learn in, in, uh, in science as well as in other areas too, of course. But in my case, I, I enjoyed research. I was pretty good at it. Uh, I, still, I still like to do the research and I believe it's necessary. I was reading not too long ago one of the uh, uh, just a, a book by, I don't know whether it's Patterson or Brown or Grisham or, you know, mm -hmm. somebody. There was a glaring mistake in it that somehow or another got all the way through everybody. I thought, you know, that's bad, but I'm a grown-up, and I'm, my life won't be impacted by that mistake. If I were a third grader, though, and I had a mistake in a book that I was reading, I wouldn't know, and I would assume that that's true, and I think that the people who write uh, or paint pictures uh, for young people have a responsibility that goes maybe even beyond that of those who write for adults. Mm -hmm. uh, they, somebody might disagree with that, but I'm just saying that when you're in that, that age where you're forming judgments and learning how to think and, and apply, uh, we need to give those kids the truth. Yeah. Um. When you're working on a book, do you have a particular age range in mind? Or do you have an I, ide ideal reader? Do you have an ideal Sometimes reader? I set out that way. My, I guess uh, at one time or another I've written books for just about everybody, but my, my sweet spot, I think, is for probably grades three through five, uh -huh. maybe six. I don't know why. We all have our comfort zone, and that's, that's my main one. Uh, I have written for pre-K. Uh, I've got one, one of the five that hasn't come out yet yeah. is, is uh, that simple. It has 32 words in it, I think, or 36 words of some really short thing, or maybe it's, maybe it's more than that, but not 100. Yeah. Um, which, of course, takes a different muscle, learning what to, right. how to say what you want to say and nothing else. You know. right. um, and I've, I've written books for older kids too, but but I really do like those three to five year olds or six year. Olds. I, I better say six now that I've written a middle grade something. Yeah, <laughs> seven even. Yeah. Um. And you, you mentioned talking about pirates. So, um, how to phrase this? So, gender inclusiveness, I guess. You mm -hmm. know. There is at least one painting I saw where there was a female pirate in one of the paintings. Well, yes, as it turns out, um, the average, well, the typical pirate of that period would be single. He would be 18 to 22, somewhere in that range, somewhere older. Yeah. Um, many of them uh, had some sort of a hang up with the law. Uh, um, many of them had been in trouble already. This was nothing new. The thought of getting rich uh, colored their thinking because the average length of, of life expectancy for a pirate was about 24 months. Mm -hmm. And so if you're 18 now, you'll probably, probably be dead when you're 20. Yeah. And the dying won't be easy. Probably you'll die from scurvy or from uh, a wound that didn't heal right. Mm -hmm. Or if you're lucky, maybe you get hanged and it's over quicker. Mm -hmm. But there's a price on your head from day one. Uh, so you can see why having girls on board would have been real trouble. I mean, these guys were fighting all the time anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. There was always a knife somewhere. And, uh, you know, all that testosterone on board for a lengthy period of time on a small boat that stank and, yeah, and yeah. was boring and, and these kids would fight uh, just because they were 
just because there wasn't anything else to do, I guess. Yeah. So if you had a female, that's really going to stir up trouble, and it was against all rules. You just didn't do that. But in spite of that, on occasion, some of these daring do young guys or gals would dress as a boy mm -hmm. and somehow managed to get on board, either because their boyfriend helped smuggle them or because they had no boyfriend, but they had the same lust for gold mm -hmm. that everybody else did. And that was maybe the first women's live movement. I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this would have been, uh, this was the early 18th century, I think. I yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it was kind of a short-lived, it peaked quickly. Yeah, it, it didn't last too long uh, because it finally just got out of hand and, and uh, all the nations were against them. And, and yeah. uh, eventually uh, they went, they, they ran them down and the last of the big names were killed off. And, yeah. And it took a, it took a, a major name to attract enough wealth to get enough boats to go out and really be a force. Otherwise you had a lot of uh, free, you know, one, one boaters that would go out and yeah. try their luck for a while and then didn't last very long. Yeah. Hmm. Kind of like being an author, I guess, too. A lot of people writing, it's hard, oh, to, make, yeah. hard to make a living mm -hmm. being a pirate or a writer. Right. <laughs> it's, it's safer, I found, to just write about pirates. <laughs> uh, so this book won some awards. Uh, at least on the copy I had. Well, I, I uh, again, I, I printed them out because I'm not good at remembering but, uh, things like that. But the first thing that happened was the uh, Kansas State Reading Circle list, which is yeah. uh, you know, a list of uh, recommended books to read by kids, uh, in this case, in Kansas. And the National Council for Teachers of English chose it in 2008 as uh, for their list of notable poetry books. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, uh, to me, uh, a very nice thing because this essentially is nonfiction. Um, this is a researched theme. Anything I've said in poetic form was based in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is an example of what we sometimes call you know, nonfiction poetry. And it's hard enough to get poetry of any kind selected these days, so I was, I was very pleased about that. Mm -hmm. I was nominated for a number of other things. One of them is something called VOYA, V-O-Y-A. Yeah, Voices of Youth Advocates or You're something. You're exactly right, sir. Yeah. Nonfiction Honor List, 2009. So they recognized it as nonfiction and honored it, even uh -huh. though it was poetry. And then the Texas Blue Bonnet Master Reading List. Uh, I was delighted about that. And the Indiana Young Hoosier Book Award Master Reading List, uh, Missouri Center for the Book, I already mentioned uh, yeah. that award. And so, yes, I was, I felt uh, rewarded for uh, the recognition that came from this uh, this book. And it all started with uh, this guy out in Tetonia, Idaho, who wanted to paint pirates. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, on a typical, if there is such a thing as a typical book project, so you got an author, maybe multiple authors, mm -hmm. you have an illustrator, maybe multiple illustrators, you've got a book designer, mm -hmm. somebody's got to design the book, yep. lay it out, and then you got the publisher that all that a publisher does, mm -hmm. promotes the book, sells the book, yeah. fulfillment they call it, where somebody orders a copy, mm -hmm. and right. 100 copies. Uh, there's a copy editor yeah. um, who is, uh, uh, there's a copy, uh, there's a proofreader, but there's a copy editor. And that one is, the, is the, the one who really goes through and challenges every word and every line to make sure that nothing's wrong or that the, something isn't going to slip through. Okay, so proofreaders just looking for typos and They're just reading for con yeah. consistency of punctuation right. and uh -huh. things like that. A copy editor, though, is saying that's content. That's why why use this word here? What about these other possible? Yeah, they'll, they'll challenge you uh, once in a while. I'll have to uh, look at a relook at a poem if it's a poem or, or yeah. prose, whatever, and either justify it the way it is and successfully argue to keep it, or uh, to agree that that is a good idea. And, yeah. uh, the book that will be coming out next year is called "And the Bullfrog." sings and until just recently it was called and the bullfrogs sing 
But it turns out that there's only one bullfrog that we're talking about in the book. And at the last minute, the copy editor said, wait a minute. The title doesn't even go with the book. There's only one frog. They just, yeah. <laughs> There's no chorus. There's no, no doo-wop frogs in the background. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, and then, uh, you know, I don't know children's literature very well, um, but I heard I heard a dis. Well, I, I'm a little bit disturbed about um, Loringell's Wilder has kind of been I don't know raked over the coals lately. <laughs> right. I don't know how to put it. You mean so? I mean the fact is that the American Li a division of the American Library Association had an award that they call the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award. She mm -hmm. was the first recipient. At some point, I think early on in the award, they decided to call it the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award. Mm -hmm. And just within the past year, they decided to remove her name from the award, not, right. not rescind the award, mm -hmm. yeah. just to remove her name from the award. Uh, uh, from what I, I wasn't involved in that, pro I'm a librarian, but I wasn't involved in that process um, at all. And what my understanding is that um, concerns were expressed about the way uh, certain Native Americans are portrayed in certain of her books. Evidently, Ma at one point said the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Mm -hmm. um, I think some aspersions uh, were made against African Americans in some of her books. And so, uh, uh, we live in a culture that's very sensitive to, um, right. uh, it's hard to tell a joke or, uh, mm -hmm. or write about uh, pirates, for example, mm -hmm. without potentially offending somebody. Right. So how do you, you know, uh, well then after that whole thing, uh, which seems to have simmered down now, um, I was talking to somebody and, uh, oh, it was with this, uh, uh, Great American Reads Initiative, right. and Tom Sawyer was the Twain book that made the hundred most mm -hmm. loved American no um, novels by, of Americans, um, mm -hmm. because there's some Russian novels in there, and I think even a couple of French novels, mm -hmm. uh, some English novels, yeah. British novels. Um, and we were talking about that, and they said, well, a lot of school districts have replaced Huck Finn, which in my humble opinion is a much better novel. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. With Tom Sawyer, because Tom Sawyer doesn't include the N-word. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I guess this has always been, you know, Shakespeare has been bottlerized. And, and, you know, how do you treat a sensitive subject, or even just a subject where you want to portray what it was like to be a pirate, but you can't talk about, you know, keel hauling someone or yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, slitting somebody from their navel to their throat uh, <laughs> in a bar fight or something, right. you know. Um, well, in, in my case, uh, and to take, just, just to stay with pirates for a minute, I, I think it's probably outside the that arena where feelings are are easily hurt. Um, pirates were, by all definitions, outlaws. And although I, I write about them fairly frankly, uh, I don't disrespect them as people. They just made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And some of those bad decisions were just really bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, I'm, you know, as a writer, I'm fully a cognizant of, of the current uh, the current situation in our culture where everybody has his feelings on his shoulder and uh, every ethnic group is concerned about protecting its own history and with dignity and honor and, and as it should as we all of course mm -hmm. should for a writer uh, if we happen to approach one of those sensitive areas. Um, it's our job to, to be aware of it and to, to treat that responsibility with great care because um, in the first place, I, I know a lot of, of authors, I don't know any of them with an axe to grind. They're, 
especially those in my group, write it for young people. Yeah. Uh, we write to inform, we write to entertain, we write to, uh, to hear ourselves talking to somebody else. We, uh, we write because we love to be hugged around the knees by a second grader. Uh, we're surrogate parents and grandparents and all the rest. And it isn't, it isn't an issue that we create, yeah. but we have to respond to it and be aware, at least be aware of it. Yeah. So far, I bumped into once recently, and that was uh, when I wrote the book, uh, a manuscript about uh, uh, that, that takes place in the Amazon, on the Amazon uh, River and upriver from there to a uh, tributary, major tributary called the Ukiyali River. And I've been there and I wrote a book, a manuscript, about a little girl who is in a, village, a remote village where they only go to grade six. She wants to be a teacher. To do that, she has to go through five years of high school and five more years of college after that. That's the way it works in Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's 10 years away from being a teacher and this is my telling of her story. Uh, and when I finished and my agent sent it out, um, one editor uh, said, I love the story. I love your girl. I love your character. But you're not Peruvian, so I can't publish it. Mm. And so that's the reality of it. Mm. Um, to my knowledge, there's no one who lives on the Ukiali River or anywhere around there who writes books for kids of any kind. Yeah. Um, and I had this uh, vetted by a lot of people, including the one Peruvian scientist, na nature, a naturalist and scientist who's been over there in that area for 25 years. He loves it, he thinks it's great. But, but he helped me. Uh, he, he helped make corrections along the way, and others yeah. did too. So I'm not Peruvian, but I, my, my daughter-in-law's Peruvian. Uh, and a lot of people she knows, and through her, a lot of people I've met now, help me make this a reasonably, I think, sound book. And certainly, nothing in it that would that would be d diminish in any way mm -hmm. the people I'm writing about. But the editor still wouldn't take it just because of of that issue. Did it finally get published? It, it's no. I just revised it oh. uh, and sent it to. That's the one I mentioned actually uh, a while ago. That was the one I meant. It. Uh, to my uh, to my agent yesterday, yeah. So it'll go out now, and we'll try it again because yeah. since then the the Peruvian scientist sent me a blurb about how much he appreciated the care I took, and um, so I've added that to it, mm -hmm. and see if that will if that will help an editor decide in my favor. Mm -hmm. um, so you're closing in on a hundred published books. Have you had any projects that, for whatever reason, just never saw the light of day? Oh, sure. If, yeah. uh, I wish I could say, heck no, but <laughs> <laughs> one of them that comes to mind is uh, a book that Dutton uh, asked me to write probably eight years ago. They had just published a very successful book about the rat, and somebody else had written it. So they turned to me and said, well, now we would like to do one about the honeybee. Would you, would you do the honors? So that was a request. And I said, yes, uh, I happen to be an old half entomologist. And um, so I did an enormous amount of work on that one. I, I, one just one entomologist I, I thought I consulted in California sent me, a, I said, what books are you using to teach? What would you suggest that I read? And he sent me three titles. I couldn't afford to buy them, but I got them on interlibrary loan. And t together they totaled just under 3,000 words. Pages, sorry, pages. Mm -hmm. I read them and made mm -hmm. notes and then I read a lot of other things too. So by the time I finished, I had what I think is one of the best nonfiction books I've ever written. In the meantime, this editor left yeah. and a new publisher came in and said, we don't do nonfiction around here anymore. Hmm. Uh, so they just, mine and a lot of others got thrown down. Hmm. And uh, so I went to other uh, houses and they would say things like, we don't think the honeybee's all that important. 
okay? <laughs> and, uh, or this is too complicated, we don't have a format for this many words, it's 10,000 words. Yeah. So it never got published and uh, I'm still kind of whiny about it, obviously. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so how many publishers have you worked with over your career? Oh boy. To date? I should be able to tell you the number because I, I looked that up not too long ago, but um, you know, Random House, Scholastic, uh, Boys Mills Press, Charles Bridge, um, where my, my head's going blank, uh, Shell Education, um, it gets up somewhere around 12 or 15 when yeah. I sit down and make a list of all of them. Yeah. Uh, Dutton. I did do something else with Dutton. Yeah. Um, not asking you to name names, but I mean, you have a, as you've worked with a dozen publishers, uh, I imagine some of those experiences were better than others. Oh, yeah. So, some of them, well, everybody has a personality and a corporate personality as well. Yeah. And, um, I have uh, an editor at, at Holiday House uh, right now who, uh, she and I go way back. And when she was at Scholastic, I couldn't sell her a darn thing. And she she would get so excited, we'd sit there, i go to New York every year, mm -hmm. schmooze a little bit with uh, editors. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she and I would sit and just have the best time brainstorming. And I'd come back to, well, then Kansas City and now here, Springfield, and send her all kinds of outlines based on what we discussed and then nothing would ever happen. She went to uh, from there to Holiday House and the first thing I sent her, she called within half an hour and took it. I mean, mm. just bam. It was, she mm. suddenly had a different culture, a different freedom. And so she has four of my books right now. Mm. Uh, and uh, so that's that's the good kind. Right. Uh, but it happens in reverse where, you know, I was a favorite son at uh, Boyd's Mills Press for a long time. I did. 20 some books, I guess, mm -hmm. well, 28, I think, last time I looked. And, but the publisher there, this was before Stephen Roxburgh, it was uh, Kent Brown. Kent retired, Stephen took over, then Kent went, uh, Stephen went away, and someone else came on board. Well, that was a, a major earthquake for me mm -hmm. because uh, she didn't know me, uh, she brought her own people to be editors and so on. Nobody knew me all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and they all brought with them their own favorites of people they were comfortable mm -hmm. publishing. So I basically had to go stand in the back of the line and earn my way back in, mm -hmm. which, you know, eventually I did. But but there was a hiatus there of maybe six or seven years when I didn't publish at Boyd's Mills, and mm -hmm. I had been just you know, mm -hmm. uh, all the time. So mm -hmm. it works both ways. Mm -hmm. What's your, uh, you know, what kind of sales do you get on your books? Is it, do some, have some really outsold others? Oh yeah, that varies all over the map. The, um, the best one I have right now is uh, Wake Up Sun, which is a picture book for the very young. Mm -hmm. And it's been in, in print since 1986. And um, its sales are over 1,100,000. Wow. It's in its 73rd printing. And it's just a little picture book. Yeah. But it, it won't go away because it's somehow hit a, you know, yeah. hit the right spot. Uh, others that I work on, and I, I probably didn't work that hard on that book. There aren't that many words in it. Although, you know, you, we always say we well, have to know the right word at the right place. Yeah. That's true enough, but still. <laughs> It isn't that long. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are books that I've worked on forever, like uh, Mammoth Bones and Broken Stones, which is the story of who came first to this continent. And we don't know. And there are a lot of good theories. And thanks to DNR, uh, DNA testing, we're getting closer to probably knowing. Uh, probably around 15,000 years or so ago. Some folks uh, look a lot like Japanese came up the, the, the uh, East Coast from Asia and crossed over on the, uh, didn't, didn't cross over, but just followed the curve back down on the West Coast of this continent, mm -hmm. probably. 
uh, whatever it was, there, whoever they were, we have a lot of good, smart uh, scientists in this country, and they don't all agree on who was first and when they got here and how they got here. And there was an enormous amount of research that went into that one and going out on digs and, and interviewing people in this country and South America. And when I finally got the darn thing done, it was, it was and I'm sure it always will be, the best piece of research I ever did. I mean, mm. It took forever. Uh, the uh, state um, archaeologist in one of the eastern states, and I've forgotten which, nominated it for us the best book on archaeology that year for, for the uh, general public. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't sell very well. Mm -hmm. um, turns out that there aren't that many people who really are that passionate about knowing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's your balance. So, in a way, you, you, sometimes you, your best seller wasn't the most wasn't the uh, book of which you were most proud necessarily. Yeah, it, it's pretty hard to to make a connection sometimes. Yeah. A, a book that that might make me happy because of some something I know about it, something that that took took something special from me, or or I'm extremely pleased with the way these phrases went, or you know, yes. all kinds of reasons why you fall in love with what you're doing. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that the reader will, or more importantly, that the people who buy the books for the reader will. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, nor can you tell much about Amazon.com uh, ratings and that sort of thing, because mm -hmm. if I write a book that will be popular with uh, school and library, uh, there may or may not be much... Uh, of an indication of that mm -hmm. on uh, online. Yeah. Then there are some books that I guess online sell well, and that is an indication of the popularity. So mm -hmm. again, you have to look look at the picture. So do you have to worry when you're writing a children's book? So there's like classroom use, mm -hmm. and then there's home use. I guess you'd call it. Yes. You know. And are those two different sort of use scenarios that you have to think about when you're writing a book? And, well, you know, yeah. how's this going to play when you got you know a teacher with twenty kids sitting around, um, mm -hmm. or uh, how's it going to play with one parent, one child bedtime story, pirates? Yeah. <laughs> well, pirates probably isn't a bedtime story. <laughs> <laughs> but was it the hempen knot or the? <laughs> That's the last yeah. thing I want to think about is. Yeah. Uh, Come on, Johnny, go get your hatchet and we'll read a bedtime story. Or I'll go to, I'll yeah. go to settle for my sins. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, when you write for school, which probably, I, I started to say probably most of us do, but I'm not sure. Maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't know for sure. Uh, but when you write for school, you know these days, and then this. Again, it swings back and yeah. forth, but currently, even though uh, Common Core State Standards is, is nowhere near as strong as it was there for a while, uh, your editor is still likely to say to you, well, like the manuscript, okay, but what's the point of it in school? What, what does it support? What oh, does it tie in with? Curricula what's the curricular support, yeah. It's, it, it has to, yeah, and in their judgment, it's not going to sell because the librarian is going to say, well, that's nice, but we're not studying that. Yeah. Uh, that's going to rot on the shelf. I need something that will support my fourth grade friend down the hall, our teacher. Yeah. And so uh, I wrote a whole book with uh, Tim Rosinski not long ago on what they studied in fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade, and I wrote poems for all that, some 90-some poems. So I'm sort of tuned into that mm -hmm. now. Uh, <laughs> So I know that if I don't come up with something that supports the, the, the core subjects, um, that odds are I either won't get it sold or if I do, it won't sell well. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm shooting for kids at home, then you're looking at a very different kind of scenario. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's, 
a county book or a bedtime story or or something. Uh, yeah, but you sort of have to decide at some point, is this going to be a home book or a classroom book? I guess you do. I, I haven't written anything on purpose lately for home other than that. Uh, <clears throat> the one I mentioned a little while ago, pardon me. <coughs> I'm doing my impersonation of an old man's voice. <laughs> it's a great impersonation. Is that your water sitting over there? You could... Yes, I thought that would help me. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the book I uh, just finished selling, which marked my 100th, is about how the body works. But I, instead of saying the toe bone is connected to the foot bone, uh, <laughs> It was uh, a little little kid who sees an apple on a on a table and, and wants it, and, and what the body does to make it possible for the for him to reach. Well, that's a bit that's a home story oh. because that's for, that's really preschool, yeah. and uh, it might make its way into preschool and maybe kindergarten, but it's essentially something that mom and dad might yeah. might read. Yeah. Okay. Um. Has the, uh, so I imagine your line of work has changed quite a bit in 50 years. Oh, yes. Um, is it more of an international, global market now? When you're, when you're writing a book, you have to think about, you know, Asian Rim kids and African kids and, you know. Well, I, uh, I don't. <clears throat> Maybe I should. Maybe I should be more aware of that. I still get translated. Uh, uh, within the last month, I've had uh, uh, a Korean translation and a Chinese translation of my most recent book with Charles Bridge, which is A Place to Start a Family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why <clears throat> they did that, but uh, I'm tickled to death. I'm, I always am. It's rare to have a translation, but when it happens, you think, yay. I, you know. yeah. but, uh, what has changed, <clears throat> I wrote this down too. My same, my same editor, Stephen Roxburgh, whom I've mentioned now before, in response to uh, my query, we finished uh, the Bug book. This was the first one we did together. Okay. Yeah. Then we did Pirates, and when he was on his way, uh, we had already started Cowboys, and that was also Dan Burr, if you, I'm sure you can tell. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. So, <coughs> I, I sent Stephen a, a note and said, what should I be doing for you next? I said, uh, B. Cullinan, who uh, was his predecessor as, ed as editor in chief of poetry, had given me the idea that I should be using themes because in school they like themes. You know, you're, you're working on a certain you know, mm -hmm. ocean life or mm -hmm. you know, apples or whatever. Right. So he says, far be it for me to appear to contradict anything uh, B. had to say. Themes pr provide convenient handles for books to be described, categorized, and generally published. I don't know that they make for the best poetry. They often seem contrived and inorganic. Hmm. The best poetry I know is poetry written about materials the poet cares deeply and passionately about. Material so engaged is bound to be compelling. You've written and published a lot of poetry. My guidance would be to write about only what deeply interests you. And if a theme emerges, fine. If not, that's fine too. Mm. But it isn't. It used to be. Mm. 25 years ago, I could write a book of poetry about things that I felt passionate about. Whatever. Yeah. Today, I couldn't give away a manuscript that is that disengaged from classroom Mm. Uh, themes, yeah. and I, I'm confident that a lot, a, a lot of good poetry is not being published today because of the cultural uh, shakeup in uh, what what poetry is supposed to be doing. Yeah. And uh, uh, 
Billy Collins in one of his books, uh, traveling, sailing alone around the room, uh, writes a poem about that subject. He tries to tell his students, these will be university kids, not to overanalyze the poem, but to enjoy it. And he says, but they insist on tying it to a chair and beating it with a rope until it confesses what it's all about. <laughs> and that's sadly what has happened yeah. in, in uh, poetry uh, in many, many cases. Now, there are still some editors, some publishers who will say, just give me good stuff. I, I don't care about school. I'm not worried about that. I just want good poetry. But boy, oh boy, there are many of them. Yeah. And most of them say, no, no, I, it has to be themed. So I, I loved Stephen's uh, advice, and I certainly I agree with it. I think you get your best poetry when you're writing about what you want to write about, and you do it to the best that you can. But uh, right now, that's not happening very often. Yeah. Do you have an agent? I do, for the first time. First time in your well, life? I had, well, I tried an agent back in 1985. Uh, briefly, about a year, uh, the only thing that got sold in that year was something I had sold. So, uh, and he and I weren't communicating very well, and so I thought, no, I'm not. I had already been published dozens of times, and mm -hmm. I didn't see any reason to, to stay with him. And he agreed. We just parted ways. Mm -hmm. But when I got around finally to writing this chapter book that turns out to be a middle grade novel. I painted myself, I wrote myself into a corner because there are very few publishers or editors who will look at an unagented middle grade novel. Who knew? Hmm. So all of a sudden I had to have an agent. Mm -hmm. And so I went to a, an editor I uh, think a great deal of. I said, okay, what do I do now? I, I don't think I can even try to peddle this, this book without, a, without an agent. So she gave me three of her favorite uh, agents. And uh, so I tried this one and, and uh, we got along just from the very beginning very well. And so uh, I gave her the information she needed and she gave me a little bit of information. We, we signed an agreement and I didn't look her up until after all that had happened and she's one of the top <laughs> five agents in the oh. country, but oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I got lucky and I'm, and I'm happy about that. I thought maybe it was their piracy in her book. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but she knows things that I, I don't. Well, she asked me, she said, you've published uh, 90 books or whatever. She said, why do you need me? I said, well, I, I need you to open doors. Yeah. I said, I need you to make it possible for me to meet other editors that I can't meet now. Yeah. And she said, that's the right answer. And uh, so we began to, to work. But she just got back from a conference. And she said she met one editor <coughs> who said, if I get a manuscript from a white writer, I won't look at it. Why? I won't waste my time with it. Yeah. She said, I'm only looking for color. Old white males? Out of the question. Hmm. It, I, yeah, that's what I said, even wrinkly old white men. <laughs> she said, no, you're the wrong color. And that's what this editor, uh -huh. right now, uh -huh. she's not looking at anything else. And uh, another one who happens to be a, an editor who happens to be a fan of mine because one of my early books was one she grew up on and I know the woman. Uh -huh. And she, worked, she was one of the editors on the Harry Potter series and, and uh, she's a smart cookie and I like her a lot. I know her family. She's not about to look at anything that's not uh, uh, an ethnic uh, book or you know, mm. author of some kind. So that's out there too. Mm. But uh, so because I have an agent now, she can lead me around some of the landmines and yeah. find the, find those uh, those editors. So still, so far, it's working out well for you. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I I like her a great deal, and, She's and uh, we correspond yeah. uh, sometimes several times in a day. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about uh, e-books, audiobooks? Well, I tried, I have one e-book, and um, it's about this lake behind me. I call this Goose Lake, 
That's not an official name. Nobody else knows about that. <laughs> it's Lake Number D70 or something like that, which has very little charm in my judgment. <laughs> uh, As a naming convention. <laughs> D70. D D D How deep is it? Oh, and you can walk across it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But it might be kind of slippery. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of geese around. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I wrote a book, uh, 2011, that I call about a, a year in the life of this lake, and uh, that was the naturalist in me came out, and there was something I am passionate about, and it was and is remains some of my best poetry. I tried uh, two or three editors with it, and they all said the same thing: it's too local. We're not interested. We you know we publish for a national audience. Nobody in Arizona is going to care about your little lake out behind your house. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I had heard about this e-publishing enough that I thought I'd finally give it a try. Yeah. And I did, and it's still hanging in there. But um, still selling. <clears throat> still selling. I looked it up yesterday. <clears throat> only as an e-book, huh? It's only available uh, that way. Yeah. Now, a lot of my publishers are bringing out my established printed <coughs> books in ebook form. So you uh, and I don't have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. It's their election to do that. Uh, the book I did on the, the cave book about the <coughs> River Bluff Cave here in town mm -hmm. is no longer in print, but you can get it uh, online as an ebook. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't think Publishers are in as big a rush to worry about that as they were ten years ago. Yeah, my, my I don't follow it that closely, but my sense is certain genres sell well as ebooks. Oh yes, I'm sure. Romances that. sell okay. well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. I have a librarian colleague who refers to you know people go through like a book a day as voracious readers, VRs. Right. Yeah. And for VRs, ebooks are a godsend. Uh -huh. Well. For kids, I think kids, especially the little ones, want to be able to gum the pages. I think. <laughs> if, if you can't, I still have that happen to me every once in a while. I just want to, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? You're sitting here with a device in your hand, trying to read to the kid. The, the pictures aren't as glorious and all that stuff. So yeah. it, it's kind of a built-in booby trap there, I think. But yeah. Uh, audio books, I'm guessing audio books don't work real well where you have a lot of highly illustrated uh, material. Not really. Uh, I don't know of any that I have. I, I've had a, a couple of cassettes out there. That, yeah. Again, I didn't initiate either one of them. <coughs> uh, where uh, the, the publisher hired somebody to do a cassette back when you could still play a cassette and uh, uh, set them to music and, and all that. And, mm. and, that's a kick. I enjoyed. Have you ever read your own work? Well, I have on occasion, um, uh, but not as a not for publication. As not as, a, I mean, I, I, as I, I, My voice will be on a oh, a blog somewhere um, yeah. where somebody uh, will ask me to do a little video. I've done some YouTube stuff where you can hear me read something from pirates or cowboys or something. Yeah. Uh, and I've been uh, interviewed uh, where I was reading, but as far as just making a reading of my work, I have not. Yeah. I kind of like to. But, yeah. I know for like adult, especially for adult fiction, um, one of the common complaints is that if you've already published, it's easy to get published again, but if you've never been published, it's really hard to break into, mm -hmm. especially with a major house, uh, it's really hard. Um, uh, because with a, you know, a published author is in some sense a safe author, mm -hmm. because, you know, do you see the same thing in your uh, area that, you yeah. know, <clears throat> once you get a hundred books under your belt, then <laughs> 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 the next hundred is just gonna be a breeze. <laughs> yeah, bear in mind, I was rejected 67 times before I sold my first one. Really? Yeah. Um, Did you see all the rejection letters? <laughs> no, and I'm sorry I didn't. I yeah. wish I had. Yeah. At least the first one. But, I mean, that, that's actually a common, uh, I mean, a lot of people that you think, boy, you know, that's such a good book. It's obvious to any publisher that 
but they went went through sometimes hundreds of rejections. Oh yeah, okay. Lou uh, not, Wilson Wilson Rawls who wrote with the Red Fern Groves mm -hmm. was a Kentucky boy, and uh, I met him. Uh, we were at the same conference, but he was the keynote speaker, <clears throat> and he had this wonderful voice, and. We just fell in love with him, you know, listening to him talk. But then he talked, and then he talked, and so on, until we finally <laughs> fell out of love with him again. But, but in the meantime, he, I remember him saying that he wrote 39 novels before he finally sold that one and only. Wow. I think he did publish something else after that. But yeah. but he didn't know how to spell, he didn't know how to write. He, he was a poor boy. He had to use a, a pencil on a, Big Chief Tablets or whatever yeah. it was called. We probably yeah. couldn't call them that now. I don't know. Right. But, but they were called Big Chief Tablets. Yeah. yeah. And so he uh, uh, he had some success <clears throat> afterwards. But before you get published, it's, it's hard because not only do you not know what you're doing from a writing point of view, and, and beginning writers are always reaching out to published people and saying, help me, help me, what am I doing wrong? Well, <clears throat> to be selfish, we're worried with our own problems and, and uh, mm. there's a limit to how much you can stop and help another human being no matter how much you'd like to. Right. And I think we all do that, but there's, there's a limit to it. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but once you, once you get published, I am going to pause. Yeah, okay. And let me get this, <coughs> this water in me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And we'll, uh, let's, uh, uh, we'll probably, let's wrap it up here pretty quick, oh. too. <coughs> so. We don't have to cover everything in one, one sitting. <coughs> I think I still have a dash of that <coughs> red tide that I brought back from oh. Florida. <laughs> uh, once you are published, Theoretically, <clears throat> the odds are improved that you will be published again. But not necessarily the next one, or the next one, or the next ten. You know, it, mm. Because even, even those of us who have been fortunate enough <clears throat> to see our name in print a lot, we still have to be as good as that next time out. Yeah. And we still have to, our mind still has to work uh, in conjunction with <clears throat> with what is going on in the publishing field. We still have to do our homework, we still have to read journals, and we still have to go appear places, and uh, it just isn't a, a, a sure shot, it's not guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Your odds certainly are improved, but there are a lot of people who give up after the first one, they could never get the second one done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so early, early on in this interview you stated that you uh, my sense of it was you. Re this is your job. This is what you work at. Correct. Right. Um, and a lot of a lot of writers are that way. It's not like well, I write when the when the fancy strikes me or something. Mm -hmm. You you're disciplined. And having said that, though, do you just have some days where it's just like you know this is like probably one of the last days of summery weather we're going to have for the next six or seven mm -hmm. or eight months? Right. You know, right. And you're yeah. just like uh, you know. Well, that's that's true. And. Uh, other writers understand that families may get a little irritated at times because of that apparent contradiction. But I go to work every morning, 32 feet from my bed. Yeah. Uh, well, there's you right here at home. I work. You know, my office is right down the hall. Yeah. And so I leave my bed, <coughs> go down to the kitchen, turn on the coffee pot, and then by the time the coffee is ready, I'm I'm already working. Yeah. And. Uh, I report to work. I'm my boss. If I don't write anything today, nobody in this entire planet will know. And nobody will care. If I don't write anything tomorrow, it's the same, same thing. Yeah. I could stop right now and the world would little note that the guy over in Missouri that used to write, <laughs> whatever, ha these whatever guys, happened to him. You know, whatever happened to good old... <laughs> uh, so it, you, you do it yourself. And nobody's going to do it for you. And if you don't feel well, tough stuff. Uh, get some Kleenex. Uh, <laughs> but be be on time and go to work. Yeah. And uh, if you don't, if nothing's coming today, tough stuff. 
stay with it. You don't, that's no excuse to get up and walk off. You, you have to hang in there and keep doing it until something does happen. Yeah. Nobody's going to do it for you. Yeah. Do you, I once, I went, uh, so, uh, you know, I write di totally different kind of book, but uh, I often use the metaphor of it's like going down into a mine. Mm -hmm. You've got to get, you got to get to the pit face. So <laughs> it take it might take you 15 minutes to half an hour mm -hmm. between the time you sit down until you get to the pit face. Yep. Um, is, it, is that the same with you? Yeah, I, I have to. Uh, well, since I'm usually working on a number of projects, that's one of the occupational hazards is that if I come back to the third one, third one from the left, <laughs> right. and I haven't, I haven't worked on it for a couple of months, uh, it may take me all day to find that same groove. Yeah. Where was I? What was I thinking? Where was, where was the pattern? Yeah. Where was I headed with this thing when yeah. I left off the last time? Yeah. And uh, so yes, that, uh, it isn't as, as simple as just picking up the so, yeah. Although I, did, I was talking to a, an author once and she said, I, yeah, I, didn't, I guess I couldn't get, didn't get a chance to press her on it, but she said that she, in essence, kept the pit face right in front of her face at all times. So if she was just five minutes waiting for a bus or something, she could do some work on that thing yeah. that she was working on. Yeah. Somehow she kept it sort of in front of her mentally. Well, I at do. all time. Yeah, I do too. When I have the luxury of working on one one thing for for a while, um, I have uh, notepads and pens stashed all around the house and uh, and in the car. And uh, when my mother was quite ill a few years ago, I was in the emergency room with her all night, and I wrote a, the uh, uh, an article for uh, Sylvia Vardell. Uh, mm -hmm because I had the time and nothing else to do and it was on my mind and I was had my yeah. pad there. Yeah. And uh, when I'm in the doctor's office, if I'm in the waiting room, I'm always writing. Uh, yeah. When, when they come in to interrupt me. And uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, you, you, you... Having said all that though, I mean, there's still, do you, do you believe in the muse and that, you know, Sometimes you just the words come and they're right, and other times you, oh, you, sure. you, well, you, know, you can't get them to come. When I was a kid, I was a pretty good baseball player, uh, pitcher, long arms, yeah. and I could throw the ball hard, but I couldn't throw it over the plate every time, no matter how hard I tried. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes, sometimes it works, sometimes you get shelled. <laughs> yeah. So, we've been speaking with David Harrison, uh, kind of dwelling on his. Uh, one of his uh, soon-to-be 100 published volumes, Pirates, illustrations by Dan Burr. So it must feel nice to sort of have, when, when you see the thing, I don't know if you get your, I don't know how many complimentary copies they give anymore. They used to give like 10. Maybe 20. Yeah, you know. But when you get that box and you open it up and there it is, oh, you yes. know. Yes. <laughs> yes. All those years of work and there it is. Yeah, the average uh, is about five years. Yeah. From the time it comes out of here somewhere. And, yeah. So it's got a long gestation period. And I get to hold it, and yes, and then I want to, I want to walk around the house with it, and I want to keep <laughs> badgering Sandy and saying, "Have you seen my new book yet?" Yeah. Until she <laughs> gives me the sign that she has indeed seen. The my neighbors new book. avoid you at all costs. <laughs> and I want to leave it out on the coffee table, and, yeah. and uh, uh, that's tolerated for. A while, and then I find it back <laughs> on my desk. <laughs> Somebody's been cleaning up. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks again. We'll continue these conversations, but we've been speaking with David Harrison about pirates. Arg. Arg. Thank Arg. you, mate. Thanks. <laughs>